Okay, welcome. Um, this chapter is dealing with uh, biotech. So it's chapter 25. Basically, what we're going to be talking about is molecular biology. Right? We're going to talk about the tools and the uses of molecular biology, um, some of the techniques, right? the benefits of molecular biology. Okay? Talk about making libraries, PCR, uh, restriction, when, restriction endonucleases, um, the construction of plasmid vectors, and what the uses of all of these might be. Okay, um, and then we'll talk about the applications. Okay, we'll also talk about transgenic animals, plants, bacteria, and potential uh, drawbacks, and of course the benefits. Okay. Uh, this is something that I have uh, quite a bit of experience with. I uh, was a molecular biologist for 30 years before um, going into teaching. And uh, I actually began in uh, transgenic plants and then uh, moved on to animal models of human disease. And uh, I've done work in uh, heart disease, brain disease, um, and eye diseases. And that's where I did uh, the bulk of my work. Okay. It's like a sub-discipline of biology. It uses microbe cells or cell components to produce products or models useful to um, the human condition. Okay. The uh, skill set is recombinant DNA. The ability to uh, work with and manipulate DNA and to create constructs that will answer, either answer a question or produce a product. Okay, so you've got um, the two branches of science here coming together. You've got applied science in which uh, you're directly trying to generate a product that could be useful in, for instance, the, uh, the treatment of disease, in my case, or um, in other um, applications. Uh, industrial applications such as the generation of a particular product that's useful uh, for industry or um, for generating uh, an organism that would be useful. Okay, For instance, in, uh, in agriculture, we might want to uh, engineer a plant that had certain nutritional value okay, or that created a particular product that we were interested in purifying and selling. Same with uh, transgenic animals. Okay. Uh, we might want them to generate a product useful, or we might want to use them as a model of human disease. Okay, so there's all sorts of possibilities here, and we'll get into um, how uh, exactly we do that. Now, we've been doing um, selective breeding ever since uh, we developed farming and animal husbandry, right? Where we would um, go out into the wild and we would look for plants or animals with uh, characteristics that we were interested in and then we would selectively breed them okay uh, we might breed animals with particular characteristics together to um, generate offspring with more of those characteristics or in the case of plants we might select seed from wild plants that had characteristics that we were interested in such as a particular type of crop right and then we would plant the seed from those um, crops in the next year and get more of those plants um, and as a result eventually um, select for varieties that are more useful to the human condition. Okay, so this is selective breeding has been going on for a long time. Okay. DNA technology's goal is to introduce traits into an organism useful to us okay, um, or to change traits in an organism in order to look at the effects, okay, or to generate a product that we're interested in, okay. We basically um, generate a DNA construct um, that either we, we synthesize de novo, all right, or that we isolate from another organism, and then we put that into an organism in whom we want to express that particular piece of DNA. Okay. Uh, we might, for instance, substitute a defective gene for, for a working gene in order to see what the effects are. Or we might insert a gene for a particular product that we're interested in 
for the purposes of, of harvesting and purifying and, and using it in a downstream application. Okay, um, there's all sorts of possibilities. Okay, generally um, when we're talking about genetic engineering, we we pick a product that we're interested in. All right, we find the gene for that product. We put that gene into a vector. Okay, a piece of DNA. Um, that we can produce in large amounts. Okay, sometimes we use bacteria as our DNA factory. Okay, and then we take that piece of DNA and then use that to introduce into the organism. Uh, and then we transform the cells of the organism to be changed and we isolate the genetically modified organism. Okay, um, the tools to do this came from work with bacteriophage work with bacteria themselves okay um, and those were um, essentially what provided us the molecular scissors and glue that are needed in order to generate a piece of DNA that you want to work with okay the genetic code is nearly universal transformations of genetic recombination process it can be done through genetic engineering and bacteria can acquire DNA in a variety of ways okay they can pull it in from the environment they can um, have it introduced into them by um, bacteriophage which are the bacterial equivalents of viruses okay um, they can uh, pick it up through conjugation in which two bacterial cells basically mate and transfer genetic material from a donor to a recipient through a device called a pillus, okay, and they can acquire it through transposition, mobile genetic elements that can literally move from one DNA molecule to another. Okay? It's rare, but it can result in profound genetic change, and if you pick your gene right, um, you can produce a product that's quite useful. Okay. In transformation, this is one of the ways that we can introduce um, foreign DNA into a bacterial cell for the purposes of manufacturing more of that genetic material or for the purposes of expressing genes on that transferred material that generate a product that we're interested in. Okay, Donor bacteria are lysed, their DNA breaks into fragments. Okay and then a recipient bacteria that can be chemically treated can pick up that genetic material in the environment it can pass through the plasma membrane and then it can either be expressed itself as a separate piece of genetic material called plasmin or it can be incorporated into the genetic material of the host bacteria it can integrate okay there's, there's multiple possibilities. Okay. So uh, let's look at how this is done. DNA transformation involves the transfer of naked DNA into a recipient cell. In the first step, double-stranded donor DNA binds to specific receptors on the surface of a competent cell. One strand of the donor DNA is degraded by nucleases while the other strand enters the cell. The single-stranded donor DNA pairs with an homologous region on the recipient DNA and is integrated into the recipient genome by a breakage and reunion mechanism called homologous recombination. If there are any differences between the nucleotide sequences of the donor and recipient DNAs, the mismatch repair system comes into play. The repair system removes either the donor or the recipient strand and replaces it with the complementary sequence. Since either strand may be repaired, some cells contain the new donor DNA and others have the original DNA sequences. In the laboratory, cells are plated on selective media so that only the transformants will grow. So, another way of introducing genetic material into a recipient is conjugation. This is a process in which a hollow tube is constructed from the donor to the recipient, and a mobile genetic element, such as a plasmid, 
is transferred from the donor to the recipient through uh, a replication process called rolling circle where a copy of that genetic material moves through the hollow tube into the recipient and then both cells uh, once the pill breaks have a copy of that genetic material. Now this is a process in some bacteria that uh, is useful for the transfer of um, these plasmids which occur out in the wild um, that contain traits useful to both the donor and the recipient. An example would be drug resistance or uh, a virulence factor that enable it to produce um, disease in a host but that is actually a benefit to both the donor and the recipient. Okay, um, Let's look at how conjugation works. Conjugation is a mechanism of gene transfer that requires direct contact between donor and recipient cells. A plasmid is a small piece of DNA, separate from the main chromosome, that carries genetic information for such things as antibiotic resistance. The first step in plasmid transfer is contact between the donor and the recipient. The pilus of the donor cell recognizes and binds to specific receptor sites on the cell wall of the recipient cell. The plasmid then becomes mobilized for transfer when an enzyme cleaves one strand of the plasmid at a specific nucleotide sequence, called the origin of transfer. A single strand of the plasmid, beginning at the origin of transfer, enters the recipient cell. Once inside the recipient cell, a complementary strand to the single DNA strand is synthesized. When donor and recipient cells are mixed together, eventually all of the cells become donors. Now, in transduction, okay, one of the things that happens is that um, we have a bacteriophage, right, which is a um, basically a, a, a parasite of bacteria, similar to what a virus is to a eukaryotic cell, and they're able to introduce genetic material contained inside their capsid into the recipient and the result is a piece of DNA that can either um, integrate into the chromosome of the recipient or can go into uh, what's called a lytic phase in which more copies of the bacteriophage are produced and uh, eventually the recipient either ruptures okay, and uh, re releases those particles into the environment or um, it ends up extruding itself through the membrane and the cell wall of the recipient um, and continues to crank out copies of that bacteriophage. Now, you, you might wonder, you know, what's the possible use of this? Um, you, can, you can create um, genetic material that you can uh, package inside these phage that um, is partly derived from the phage DNA and partly derived from DNA from a source that you designate. Okay, and then you can package that that recombined DNA up into the phage and introduce it into the bacteria, which then can uh, express those phage in large quantity. All right, and these. This is part of what's called making a library, okay? Basically, fragments of genetic material from your other source are um, reproduced in the recipient bacteria, and then they rupture and generate plaques, which represent large copies of that particular fragment of DNA, and then we have ways to detect whether or not that, uh, that genetic material of interest is present in those 
in those plaques. Okay, and then if we find it, we can uh, isolate the genetic material from those plaques uh, and study it further. Right? So that's the that's the use of transduction. Sometimes you can use transduction um, in order to generate just recombinant bacteria, and they can express that piece of genetic material uh, for the purposes of either making more copies of it or for um, expressing a product that's contained in the transduced DNA. Okay, so let's look at how transduction works. Specialized transduction involves the transfer of only a few specific genes from one bacterial cell to another by means of a phage. The lambda phage, which infects E. coli, is a well-studied example of a specialized transducing phage. When lambda phage infects E. coli, the phage DNA enters the cell and then integrates into a specific site on the host chromosome. When an E. coli culture carrying the lambda phage is induced, phage particles are produced. On rare occasions, a piece of bacterial DNA, for example the gal gene, near the specific site of insertion remains attached to the phage DNA and a piece of phage DNA is left behind. The phage that develop are defective because they do not carry the entire phage genome, but can still infect other cells. The defective phage can attach to another bacterial cell and the DNA can be injected. Both phage and bacterial DNA now become integrated into the new host chromosome. Only bacterial genes located near the site of integration of the phage DNA can be transduced, hence the term specialized transduction. With um, the tools of genetic engineering, what we're trying to affect is the ability to manipulate genetic material in a way that's useful to us. Okay? Restricted enzymes are basically molecular scissors, which we can use to cut genetic material at specific DNA sequences. They generate pieces of DNA that can be easily annealed or attached to each other and then sealed with an enzyme called ligase. Okay? Gene libraries are basically collections of DNA from a source that uh, contains somewhere in that library a gene of interest. Okay? And uh, we can generate these libraries by fragmenting DNA from the source and then uh, placing it in DNA um, that then can be grown up and amplified in a recipient, such as a bacterial cell. Okay. Plasmids are mobile genetic elements that occur in the wild, but we can engineer plasmids in order to be vectors that we can use to shuttle pieces of DNA between organisms. Okay. cDNA is basically a DNA copy of a piece of messenger RNA that we can then use in a, a construct. Okay, so cDNA is basically um, can indicate expression of particular genes, or can be used to actually snag simply the protein coding portions of a gene. And the PCR is a technique used to amplify genetic material uh, for the purposes of uh, sequencing it or manufacturing it, and then um, understanding what's contained in that genetic material by comparing it to a database, or um, taking that genetic material um, that's produced in the, in the amplification reaction and using it in downstream applications. Okay. DNA cleaving enzymes are restriction enzymes. Now these are naturally occurring pieces of genetic material that are actually used by bacteria to defend themselves against attack from things like bacteriophage, right? The, the, the application in the wild is to chop up incoming DNA so that it can't damage the recipient, right? Basically shatter it into little tiny pieces. But what we were able to do is to um, isolate these proteins, okay, um, purify them, and generate um, a, a class of 
restriction endonucleases called type 2 that cut DNA at specific sequences, okay, and produce um, DNA fragments that have either what we call blunt or sticky ends. Okay, a blunt end is simply uh, a stretch of DNA that has both strands end at the exact same location, okay, and sticky ends are uh, fragments of DNA that have an overhang in one or other strand that can be used to anneal to genetic material that has the same type of overhang. Okay, and then we can seal that with another type of enzyme that we isolate uh, and purify from bacteria called ligases. We basically stitch the uh, phosphodiester backbone of the DNA together and we make one hybrid molecule. Okay. Uh, over 800 restriction endonucleases have been identified and purified, um, and some of them have even been engineered to cut specific sequences that we want. Uh, they're named after the bacteria that they are isolated from, and then three letters uh, uh, from that bacteria and Roman numerals in the order of their discovery. Okay. Um, the origin of this, right, in the 50s, Salvador Luria and colleagues discovered that E. coli could resist destruction by bacteriophage. The organism could restrict the replication of the virus. That's the basically the immunological um, aspect of this for the purposes of the bacteria. And in 62, Werner Arbor and his research group identified the mechanism by which E. coli could achieve that restriction. And those were the endonucleases. Okay? So the ones that are useful as tools for the, for the molecular biologist are the type 2 restriction into nucleases that cut at a specific site, okay, um, as opposed to the type 1, which bind to a specific site but then cut at random locations distant to it, right? So examples include uh, restriction of nucleases uh, like echo R1, which is isolated from the E. coli, uh, strain RY13 for the R, and the first, it was the first enzyme discovered from that type of bacteria, so echo R1, all right, BAM H1 from Bacillus uh, amyloliquefaciens, strain H, and was first endonuclease discovered. Okay, so that's where it comes from. So that, that's that's fine for the naming of, of the enzyme, but the interest for the molecular biologist is what DNA sequence does it cut at, so that we can use those sites um, to provide us uh, the opportunity of taking a, a, a fragment of DNA from one source and annealing it to DNA from another source, such as a vector, and generating a molecule that we can then introduce into a recipient, such as a, maybe a yeast cell or a bacterial cell, and generate large numbers of uh, that DNA molecule using the recipient as a factory. Okay. So they cut DNA at specific sequences and generate either blunt or sticky ends. We'll see what those are about, okay? The molecules are then um, mixed together, um, molecules that have compatible ends, all right? And then they're joined by the base pairing of sticky ends. It's called annealing, which are then sealed by DNA lycase, and then you make a recombinant molecule, all right? So uh, let's see how that happens. Restriction endonucleases are enzymes that cleave DNA at specific nucleotide sequences. The sequence recognized is often four to six nucleotides long. For example, the restriction endonuclease, ECOR1, recognizes the sequence GAATTC. The nucleotides at one end of the recognition sequence are often complementary to those at the other end. The two strands of the DNA duplex have the same nucleotide sequence running in opposite directions for the length of the recognition sequence. Because the same recognition sequence occurs in both strands of the DNA duplex, the restriction endonuclease can bind to and cleave both strands of the DNA molecule. Because the bond cleaved is typically not positioned in the center of the recognition sequence and the DNA strands are antiparallel, the cut sites are offset from each other. After cleavage, each DNA fragment has a single-stranded end a few nucleotides long, and the single-stranded ends of the two fragments are complementary to each other. 
These single-stranded ends can pair with each other, sticky ends. Once their ends have paired, the two fragments can be joined together with the enzyme DNA ligase, which reforms the phosphodiester bonds of DNA. What makes restriction endonucleases so valuable is that any two fragments of DNA produced by the same restriction endonuclease can be joined together. Restriction endonucleases are fundamental tools in genetic engineering. So, if we look here, okay, examples of restriction endonucleases with blunt ends, ALU1, ECHOR2, HA3, HBA1, SMILE1. Okay, so the idea here is that there are no overhangs. Um, you have to be lucky enough to get the blunt ends to um, be close enough together that a ligase can seal them uh, directly, and that way you can join DNA fragments that end in any DNA sequence, okay? Whereas, uh, if we look at enzymes that generate sticky ends, okay, if you get a compatible overhang, the, uh, the, the overhangs can hybridize to each other, right? And that is, makes it more likely that those DNA fragments will, will attach to each other, and then you can seal those ends together with DNA ligase, okay? So examples include ECHOR1, BAMH1, HINDI3, PST1, SAL1, okay? All of these can be used as tools. Okay. Gene libraries are composed of a series of cells of unicellular organisms that store genes from foreign cells. The desired gene then um, can be acquired or detected and then isolated, okay? Uh, it's estimated that human cells have a total of 100,000 genes and only one gene may be the target of interest, such as the gene for, say, insulin, okay, or the gene for human growth hormone. So if you were after that, um, when you wanted to create a library, what you would do is you would uh, take DNA from your source, uh, you would shatter it, okay, using, say, a restriction endonuclease, and then those fragments would be um, annealed to recipient DNA, that could be packaged into um, a vector, all right, or into a phage. Okay, uh, you could you could create a gene library, say, by taking those those random pieces of DNA and then um, annealing them to a plasmid, all right, that had compatible ends, and then taking those constructs that you've produced and introducing them into bacterial cells and growing colonies, okay? That's one way to do it, right? Or you could do it by taking genetic material from a source and annealing it to genetic material that could be packaged inside of a phage and then using that phage library to infect bacteria and then uh, try to detect your gene from there, all right? So um, how is it that you that you um, detect your gene, okay? And there's a variety of ways you can do it, okay? One way is to probe for your gene of interest using a piece of DNA that you generate and you label with uh, radioactivity, right? And then you um, take your library, all right, which you can, um, you can grow on a plate of nutrient agar, right? And... Um, you can uh, anneal your probe to um, genetic material from that plate, okay? Uh, one application, for instance, if you were to do it just in recipient bacteria, is to uh, overlay um, a piece of filter paper onto the plate and then to um, allow some of that genetic material uh, to attach to the filter paper all right, uh, just through contact, and then you can treat that filter paper in a way that lyses the bacteria that got onto the filter paper, releases that genetic material, and then you can treat it in such a way that the genetic material covalently binds to the filter, right? And then you can probe with your radioactive probe for the genetic material of interest, all right? And what will happen then is the probe will anneal 
to pieces of DNA that are homologous to the probe, you can then wash off any probe that, that binds non-specifically, right? and then the only probe that remains would be the probe that sticks to the target. And then you can take that piece of filter paper and you can expose it to x-ray film, or in some cases to uh, a device that detects um, the, the radioactivity, okay, such as a, uh, they manufacture uh, screens that can do that, all right, and then um, you turn around and you either develop the x-ray film or you take the screen and you scan it, all right, and uh, you end up with now a representation of where in your library you've got hotspots, right, and those hotspots are going to contain your gene of interest, okay, so now how do you go back and find the bacteria that harbor it, um, you go back to the original plate, okay, you match up what's on your, your scan or your film to what's on the plate, and then you pick that colony, or in the case of a library, that plaque, and then grow it up, okay. So one of the techniques that's useful here is replica plate, all right, in which you take your bacterial suspension, uh, your library, you uh, plate it onto nutrient agar, by using, you know, a, 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 a sterilized glass hockey stick. Okay, you basically spread that all around the uh, nutrient agar, and then you uh, you incubate it and you grow it up and you get colonies, right? And then those colonies can be uh, replica plated onto another nutrient agar, so that you get basically a copy of what was on the original plate growing on a, a separate plate, right? And then you can use the original plate. To transfer genetic material to a filter like I described and then probe it okay and the idea there is to you know go and find your gene and then once you find it isolate it grow it up work with it in downstream applications okay our next topic is uh, cDNA okay what cDNA is is essentially a um, a DNA copy of a messenger RNA all right and the enzyme that does this is actually something that was isolated from retroviruses called reverse transcriptase, whose enzymatic function is to make DNA from RNA. Okay, so for a retrovirus, it's a way to reproduce itself using uh, the DNA copy of its RNA genome uh, in order to manufacture more genome to box up into phage and then release to infect other hosts. But for the purpose of the molecular biologist, it's a tool to make a stable version of a message that can then be used for downstream applications. Okay, uh, for if it's a gene that comes from a eukaryotic cell, it's basically going to be a copy of what's in the gene without the introns, all right, which are the non-protein coding parts of the gene. If it's from bacteria, it's simply going to be a DNA copy of a transcript. Okay, so let's look at how. CDNA is made. In most eukaryotes, the expressed segments of the gene, called exons, are separated by intervening sequences of nucleotides, called introns. The exons and introns are transcribed by RNA polymerase, generating what is called precursor messenger RNA. The introns are then excised from the precursor messenger RNA, and the exons linked together to form the mature messenger RNA. Prokaryotic cell DNA does not contain introns, and prokaryotic cells are therefore unable to remove the introns from eukaryotic DNA and make functional messenger RNA. Therefore, eukaryotic DNA cannot be cloned directly into prokaryotic cells to make useful eukaryotic proteins. Before eukaryotic DNA can be cloned into prokaryotic cells, the mature eukaryotic messenger RNA must be isolated and used to make DNA without introns. The enzyme reverse transcriptase is used to convert the purified eukaryotic messenger RNA into double-stranded DNA. The resulting DNA, called complementary DNA or cDNA, can then be cloned into a bacterial cell. Genes cloned as cDNA can be transcribed and translated by the bacterial cell machinery. Is manufactured from 
um, it's uh, it's sequenced from a database. Okay, so you have a, a gene of interest, and what you want to do is um, essentially uh, see if um, it's present. All right. Um, in an organism of interest, you want to manipulate it, okay, and the result then is that you want to you want to make that on a machine, okay. Basically, solid state production of DNA. Um, you just send your sequence uh, into the uh, the company that that has the device. They manufacture the genetic material for you, and they ship it back to you as a powder. Which you then reconstitute and use for other applications. Okay, um, these days you can make either short stretches of DNA called primers, which you can use in an application known as PCR, where you want to amplify a particular piece of DNA from a source sample and make large quantities of it so that you can uh, use it for downstream applications. Or, uh, in some cases, you can manufacture entire genes. Okay on a DNA synthesizer and then simply use those uh, to generate a transgenic organism okay um, or to use in um, other downstream applications okay you have to know the nucleotide sequence that you're interested in and then basically the machine stitches it together for you instead of you stitching it together in the lab using restriction endonucleases and ligases okay um, it used to be an expensive way to do things, but now it's much less so. And so it's affordable in some cases to simply avoid using the, the traditional, traditional tools of molecular biology, restriction endonucleases and ligases and transformation processes, and simply order what you want. Okay? Um, for instance, instead of manufacturing a plasmid that has particular characteristics, you could simply order that plasmid, uh, have it shipped to you, and then use it in your application, okay, and avoid the process of, uh, you know, the trial and error of coming up with your construct through traditional methods, okay, simply pay for it. Plasmids are simply circular pieces of DNA, okay, in the wild, plasmids provide um, virulence factors, which are basically genes that provide a selective advantage for the recipient organism, and um, they um, basically are a way to transfer traits from donor to recipient, right? Such as drug resistance, such as the production of particular proteins that provide the recipient the ability to spread its range in a host organism. Okay, um, there's all sorts of examples of. Uh, diseases that, that acquire drug resistance as a result of the acquisition of plasmids that are already out there in the wild. Okay? But what a molecular biologist uses the plasmid for is as a, um, a tool to move genes from one organism to another or to express genes in an organism for the purposes of seeing what the effect is. Okay? Um, segments can be inserted into um, an engineered plasmid using restriction endonucleases and DNA ligases as we've described um, and then we can introduce that say into a bacterial cell that can reproduce every 20 minutes and make huge amounts of this construct which I can then use for another application okay so let's look at um, how plasmids are utilized Plasmids can be good cloning vectors because they carry an origin of replication and are therefore able to replicate independently within a cell. Most plasmids used as vectors also encode some type of selectable marker, such as the gene for resistance to ampicillin. If the host cells are ampicillin sensitive, the only host cells that can grow on a medium containing ampicillin are those that have taken up the plasmid. Vectors must also have a small sequence of base pairs that can be recognized by a restriction enzyme. When this enzyme opens the circular plasmid, foreign DNA can be incorporated.
When the plasmid vector and foreign DNA are both cut with the same restriction enzyme and mixed together, not all molecules will join to form recombinants. Some vector molecules will reanneal without incorporating foreign DNA. To identify cells that contain plasmids that have incorporated foreign DNA, a second marker gene is needed on the vector. This second marker contains the restriction enzyme site within its nucleotide sequence. If foreign DNA is inserted, the second marker is inactivated. This is referred to as insertional inactivation. A common second marker is the LAC-Z gene, which codes for the enzyme beta-galactosidase. Beta-galactosidase can cleave a colorless chemical called X-gal to form a blue compound. Therefore, colonies of cells that harbor the intact vector, but no new recombinant DNA, can make beta-galactosidase and form a blue color in the presence of X-gal. However, colonies that contain new recombinant DNA cannot make beta-galactosidase and are white. is a mechanism that we can use to detect a DNA sequence in a sample. Right? It involves the use of primers, buffers, and a thermostable DNA polymerase isolated from bacteria that can grow in very high temperatures and yet reproduce their DNA despite those high temperatures. Okay? The idea is that the polymerase serves as a tool that allows us to uh, manufacture DNA and then stop and wait for a denaturation and a renaturation process and not have the enzyme become inactivated due to the temperature change and then repeat that cycle once again. Okay, So priming is where the primers bind to single-stranded DNA. Primers are something you can, you can purchase, you can designate a sequence, and then you can have those primers sent to you from a company, and then um, they get added to the mix along with the nucleotides and the thermostable polymerase and the buffer, and then that mixture is put into something called a thermocycler, which simply changes temperature in, in a precise uh, timed pattern over and over again. Okay, In extension, the DNA polymerase is added and the synthesis takes place, and then this is repeated over and over again. Okay, So in PCR, all right, um, what happens here is that uh, this is a, a cycle right, that can, in 45 minutes, make large amounts of your desired product. Okay, well, So let's take a look at what PCR is all about. The polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, is a technique that can produce over a million-fold amplification of target DNA within a few hours. PCR requires specific oligonucleotide primers and plenty of nucleotides for DNA polymerization. The DNA polymerase must be heat-stable because PCR requires repeated cycles of heating the solution to 95 degrees Celsius. Heat-stable polymerase is obtained from thermophilic bacteria or archaea. In PCR, the reaction mixture is heated to 95 degrees Celsius for 30 seconds to denature or separate the DNA strands. The temperature is then lowered to 55 degrees Celsius for 30 seconds, which allows the oligonucleotide primers to anneal to known DNA sequences flanking the target DNA. The oligonucleotide primers, which are usually 20 to 30 nucleotides in length, are made so that they are complementary to the flanking sequences. The temperature is then brought to 72 degrees Celsius, which is the optimal reaction temperature for the heat-stable DNA polymerase. The polymerase uses the primers as starting points for DNA synthesis, adding one nucleotide at a time to create a complementary strand of DNA. The cycle is repeated, starting with the 95 degrees Celsius heating step, cooling the solution to 55 degrees Celsius allows the primers to anneal. Heating the solution back to 72 degrees Celsius allows polymerization to proceed.
After two cycles, four double-stranded target DNA sequences exist. After the third cycle, eight copies exist. After the fourth cycle, 16 copies exist. After 25 cycles, about 30 million copies of the target DNA exist. Because PCR reactions require 25 to 30 heating and cooling cycles, a machine called a thermocycler is used to reproducibly and rapidly deliver these cycles. Pieces of DNA that we manufacture, okay, or synthesize, um, that allow us to move genetic material from one organism to another. Okay, vectors need to be small. They have to survive in in both targets. Okay, uh, they need to have recognizable genetic markers that you can either select and or screen for, and they need to provide required promoters. Okay. So this is something that uh, was uh, described previously uh, when we were talking about plasmids, okay? Um, and they indicated the, uh, the components needed in a plasmid for it to be an effective tool, right? Plasmid vectors um, that are genetically modified generally have a, um, a selectable um, gene on them for, say, drug resistance, all right? they have a, 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 a polycloning site which is engineered to have lots of different restriction endonuclease recognition sequences inside of a gene that you can screen for right um, a typical example would be the gene for beta galactosidase which when intact um, can act on a substrate um, that you feed a bacterial cell that turns the colony blue okay However, if a piece of uh, genetic material from another source is cloned into the, the polycloning site in the middle of the, uh, of the screenable gene, then the beta-galactosidase isn't produced and the colony remains white. Okay? So it's called blue-white screening. Okay? Uh, lambda phage vectors are used to clone large pieces of genetic material using the lambda phage as a bacteriophage. Uh, the purpose of this, for instance, might be to uh, generate uh, a library from a source, okay? Or it might be to uh, utilize that piece of genetic material to transform a recipient organism, okay? Cosmid vectors are created by combining a cDNA fragment from a virus uh, with parts of a plasmid, okay? So the idea there is that you can create um, a library inside a cosmid vector and then you could turn around and uh, box that up into um, something like a bacteriophage, okay? So these are all tools, right? Um, and then you could turn around and use that library um, to transform recipient bacteria, and then you can try to detect your gene okay, using a probe, okay? or using PCR. Okay, um, a, a word about PCR, right? Amplifying genetic material in and of itself is useful to detect your target. That's fine. Okay, but it can also be used to synthesize a piece of DNA that has properties that are useful in a downstream application. For instance, if you wanted to um, have a piece of your DNA with, let's say, desired restricted endonuclease sites at either end because you wanted to clone it into a vector, all right, you could put those restricted endonuclease sites into your primer, all right, and then you could make an amplification product that would be your target flanked by those restriction endonuclease sequences which would make it easier for you to clone it into a vector and then use it for another application. Okay, so that's just one example of uh, what it's good for. All right. In human medicine, why do we do this? Okay, um, we might want to manufacture a product for use as a therapeutic. Okay, one of the earliest examples was the production of insulin 
um, using recombinant DNA technology. Okay? The old way of isolating insulin for diabetics was to take cow pancreas and crush it up and purify the insulin from the cow pancreas and then sell that purified protein but it was very very expensive and the yield was very very low okay so somebody figured out that you could take the sequence of the gene for human insulin and you could clone it into a vector that you could introduce into a bacterial cell and get the bacterial cell to manufacture that protein for you and then harvest it in large amounts and purify it uh, without having to go through the tedious process of isolating protein from a cow pancreas, okay? And this is actually the, the majority of the insulin that's sold today, okay? So it's a huge breakthrough. Um, you can also uh, manufacture synthetic antibodies this way. Uh, you can manufacture uh, hormones that are protein-based this way. Um, all of this uh, you, can, you can do in transgenic organisms using this type of biotechnology. Okay, um, you can um, use it, for instance, in the treatment of hemophilia. Okay, in hemophilia, you're you're born missing one of the proteins that are part of the clotting cascade, uh, and so to fix the problem, you need that protein in your blood. Okay, and since your liver can't make it because you weren't born with the operating gene in this case, if you're a hemophiliac, um, you can use protein derived from transgenic bacteria that receive the plasmid that contains the gene for the missing clotting factor and then you don't have a blood clotting problem. Okay, So that's just another example of an application, right? Making products useful to the human condition. Okay, uh, Tissue plasminogen activator can be used in diseases uh, involving blood clots, okay? Um, to dissolve those clots, right? Interferon is a defense against viruses and is an anti-cancer drug, okay? And uh, we can make purified interferon that we can use in therapeutic applications, okay? Antisense molecules can be used to treat um, genetic errors, okay? Antisense um, RNA is a way to knock down the expression of particular genes without actually going in and uh, altering the gene itself. Okay, and the reason it works is because um, eukaryotic cells don't like double-stranded RNA, and that's what gets formed when you make a, an antisense molecule, and will chop it up. Right, so this is called a knockdown as opposed to a knockout. Right, in a knockout. You, you substitute a defective gene for a functioning one in order to see what happens. In a knockdown, um, what you do is you create antisense RNA to the transcript that comes from the gene you, that you want to reduce the expression of, and the result is that the expression is reduced because the message gets annealed by these antisense RNA molecules, and then the, the cell destroys it. Okay, and so you don't get expression from uh, that particular gene because the message isn't used to make protein because it gets destroyed. Okay, erythropoietin uh, stimulates bone marrow to produce red blood cells. It's a protein-based hormone, and so you can produce it using molecular biology and uh, molecular genetic techniques the same way we did with insulin. Okay, phage therapy. Right, we can attack desired target cells without disturbing normal flora because of the high specificity of phage, okay? So we can engineer phage to, to go after a particular target, and kill it without wiping out your beneficial microbes. This has been researched and used uh, over in uh, Russia, okay? There hasn't been any authorization of phage testing in the U.S. yet, okay? Uses uh, to attack specific bacterial cells or to carry cytotoxic drugs to cancer cells that can kill them. Okay. Right. In human medicine, subunit vaccines can be used as a way of inducing a primary immune response that allows us to uh, resist um, the presence of that pathogen in um, uh, an actual pathogen. Right. 
so the, the antigen is basically a surface molecule that your immune system recognizes as foreign and then it, it selects for cytotoxic T cells and B cells to attack anything bearing that antigen on its surface. Okay, So um, the way that we generate adaptive immunity naturally is to simply catch these diseases and recover from them and in the course of that select for memory cells, memory lymphocytes that stay with us our whole life. And in the event that we see that antigen again, we're able to destroy anything it's attached to before it makes us sick, right? Well, a vaccine is sort of a way to, to get around that without you actually getting the disease. We inject you with antigen from a source, okay? You generate a primary immune response to what's in the vaccine that you just received. And then um, when, you, when you encounter the pathogen bearing an antigen out of the environment, you don't have a primary immune response to it. You have a secondary immune response, which means you don't get sick. Okay. Um, subunit vaccines basically are simply surface molecules that have been cloned into plasmids um, that are introduced into harmless bacteria. The bacteria express these proteins, and then you purify them and use them in the shot. Okay. And so the benefit there is that uh, you can take a large number. Of, of antigens to produce in these bacteria and include them in the shot so that you're going to generate a primary immune response to all these different antigens, right? And the other benefit is that you don't run the risk of, um, of what sometimes happens in, in old-fashioned vaccines that actually use um, a defective pathogen, pathogen that's been rendered uh, non-infectious by, say, heat killing it, okay? Um, which would sometimes revert to an active strain, and then you could get a shot that contains the actual pathogen in it. Okay, subunit vaccine. There's no chance of that happening because all you're getting is a piece of protein that comes from a harmless bacteria. Okay, there's no chance of getting infected. DNA vaccines are a variant to this, and what happens with a DNA vaccine is that you actually take genetic material containing um, genes that express the antigens that are on the suspected pathogen, um, that DNA transforms your own cells, okay? Your own cells express that DNA and thus express that antigen and then display it on, on the surface, all right? And then you generate a primary immune response to that, all right? And now, when you encounter that antigen on a pathogen, then you're going to have a secondary immune response to it instead of a primary one. And as a result, you're going to be uh, less likely to get sick. Now, we've talked about vaccines in the past because um, we've discussed the fact that a vaccine is only as effective as the uh, mutation rate of the target, right? The higher the mutation rate of the target, the less likely the vaccine is going to be effective, okay? And I gave the examples of the COVID vaccine, which has basically not been as effective as we had hoped, versus the polio vaccine, which has been effective for many decades. Okay, The polio virus has a low mutation rate, and thus the vaccine against polio, which was actually developed at the University of Cincinnati, as was the enzyme used in PCR, Okay, although the technique of PCR wasn't developed at UC, the, uh, the enzyme was discovered and purified at UC, okay, so hooray for UC, um, but um, the, uh, the idea here, right, is to, um, in, in the case of a DNA vaccine, express these antigens, right, if, if the mutation rate of the target is very, very high, okay, then the vaccine is less likely to be effective because you're more likely to run into a variant of that pathogen out in the environment. Okay, so you will be you'll be safe against what's in the shot, right? But you won't necessarily be safe from catching the disease because you're very likely to run into a variant of that pathogen that doesn't bear that antigen. Okay, so you know that's that's just that's true of any vaccine. Okay, the higher the mutation rate of the target, the less effective the vaccine is going to be. Okay. Um, we can use this for agriculture too. Okay, we can make transgenic plants that harbor herbicide resistance 
They can tolerate uh, insect pests and viruses and fungi. Okay, we can also engineer them to uh, express nutrients. Okay, and one example is golden rice. Okay, in a lot of diets uh, in in the Far East, um, they're heavy on on rice. Okay, which is basically just starch, and as a result, uh, sometimes they're deficient in certain vitamins like uh, vitamin A. Okay, and so we've generated uh, transgenic rice that expresses vitamin A. Okay. And so when you use that rice in your cooking, um, you're, you end up not being deficient in that vitamin, which is important for metabolism. Okay? So another example of introducing a nutrient that's, that's useful. Okay? Transgenic animals can receive genes from other organisms and provide disease solutions, um, such as um, serving as source material for defective human parts, like heart valves uh, from transgenic pigs. Okay, or in some cases, all right, um, we can engineer transgenic animals um, to not have an immune system. Okay, an example of that is the nude mouse. Okay, um, the nude mouse uh, has no immune system. It's been genetically engineered to not reject tissue from any other source. And so you can take human tissue and you can grow it on the mouse. All right, and then you can harvest that human tissue and use it to repair damaged structures in the human, okay? For instance, to uh, replace an external ear, okay? We can grow that on the nude mouse and then harvest it, okay? Obviously, with no immune system, the mice have to be bred in a sterile environment. That's exactly what we do, okay? Mammals um, are modified to produce therapeutic proteins in their milk, which we can then purify and use for applications as well. Okay. All right. Uh, that draws this podcast to an end. Okay. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to be with you, you know, live today, but I've I've got a schedule conflict here because um, uh, another one of my schools has actually started up right at the end of your term. Okay, and so I've got an overlap here that I hadn't anticipated. Um, so that's why I had to sort of do this a different way. Um, what we will do uh, in our next meeting is uh, the, the way we've done it before. We will have um, some Q&A over last week's material, and uh, then you guys can go ahead and do the testing component, all right? Um, and that's going to be from Module 8, all right? So if you have any questions, uh, make sure and hit me in the email, all right? Um, if you want to put it in chat, I'll take a peek at it when I get a, when I get an opportunity. Um, otherwise, uh, I thank you for joining me today.